Here is a Samsung DVD HR734 DVD and hard disk drive recorder I recently found in the e-waste. This is not a very good model, I know, because my parents had one of these about 10 years ago, and that one was thrown away about 10 years ago because the DVD drive failed. I don't have the remote control for this one, so I can't operate it. The buttons on the front don't allow for that. So instead, I'm going to tear it apart. This is the front of the recorder. And here is the back of the unit. This was made in Slovakia, which is interesting. I did not know Samsung had production facilities in Slovakia, although it is safe to say that the only thing that happened there was the final assembly of the unit. Here is the inside of the unit. I found a date code, 2006. This is older than I thought. Over here is the tuner. I noticed on the back it says VHF and UHF, which indicates that this does not yet have a digital tuner, but it does have all these blank spaces along here, so maybe a different model had a digital tuner, which had some additional circuits in these spaces. The inputs and outputs are over here, there is the DVD drive, and this is the DVD drive with support for DVD-RW. I guess that's what that sticker means. The power supply is over here, and this looks quite nicely made. This board contains all the video processing. There are two big Magnum-branded processor chips on here. And over there is the hard disk drive, and the sticker already gives it away. This is a 160 gigabyte hard disk drive. And it seems like all of these DVD recorders, they either came with an 80 gigabyte drive or a 160 gigabyte drive. I've never really seen any different sizes. Here is the front circuit board. This is the DVD HR734 Fun Key. Well, unfortunately, that is just an abbreviation. It stands for Function Keys or Function Keyboard or something like that. There is no fun in this. Really, the only interesting component is this LED display. The way this works is there are tiny little surface mount LEDs in the back. There is a circuit board all the way at the bottom of this white box. And then there are light pipes guiding the light and shaping the light into all these symbols. And you can see how they cheapened out and made the HDD and the DVD indicators share the D in the center. Well, I guess it's kind of creative as well. Also, there is an indicator for DVD RAM. Now, this DVD recorder did not support DVD RAM, but maybe a different model did. And finally, here are all the components that I'm going to keep. Obviously, the 160 gigabyte Seagate hard disk drive. This will have some sort of a Linux file system on it, but it can easily be reformatted to NTFS or something like that. The cage that the hard disk drive was mounted in, this can be used to mount a hard disk drive to something else. And I do actually already have an application for this in mind. I'm keeping the whole entire power supply board simply because most of the components on here are potentially useful. So I'm keeping the whole entire thing and I can then go and pick off any component when I actually need it. 
12 volt cooling fan, the loading motor of the DVD drive. All the other motors were special types that weren't that useful. The belt, various diodes, a random cable. I'm also keeping the power cord, but I did not feel like arranging that on the table. Also, the power connector and cable of the hard disk drive, various pieces of hardware and a couple of springs, some of the connectors, a section of the faceplate. This has the color filter for the display in it, and that can be cut out and reused for another display. And I've also unsoldered some capacitors. These should be fine. I have tested some of them, but then I had an unfortunate incident with my good old component tester, which seems to have corrupted the firmware. So that is bad news. Anyway, that's it for this DVD recorder. And here is a Pioneer DVR-433H DVD and hard disk drive recorder from 2005. So slightly older than the Samsung, much better than the Samsung, much heavier. This is very well built and probably also capable of a much higher picture quality. But again, unfortunately, I don't have the remote control for this. And you would think that with this joystick on the front, you could operate this without the remote control. But unfortunately, that is still not the case. For example, there are no fast forward or rewind buttons on this. An original remote control costs about 50 euro, and I know some people will disagree with me on that, but this thing is just not worth putting 50 euro into it. It's quite scratched up, it's dirty, it's in rather bad condition. It does not have support for DVD RAM. It can do DVD RW. And I have plenty of other DVD and hard disk drive recorders in much better condition with the original remote control. People have been throwing out these recorders left, right, and center during the past years. There is absolutely no shortage of them. Here are the front connections. The vacuum fluorescent display is quite dim, but to be fair, that's also the case on my other good DVD and hard disk drive recorders. These late vacuum fluorescent displays just don't last. Here is the back. This one was made in China. Manufactured August 2005. And they felt the need to put a warning right there. This screw cannot be any longer than four millimeters. Here is the inside of the Pioneer. This is quite different to the Samsung. The power supply stretches all along the side. And I have to say, I actually like the power supply in the Samsung better. The heat sinks on this one are really flimsy. Here is the cooling fan with air guide out to the back. The inputs and outputs are connecting to a double-decker circuit board along there. Quite a lot of surface-mounted capacitors in this one. I don't think there were any in the Samsung. There is the tuner circuit board. The DVD drive is all enclosed in metal, much higher quality than on the Samsung. And this one is using a Western Digital hard disk drive which is covering another board down below. The hard disk drive has been removed, revealing the board below. This is the processing board with a processor made by Pioneer themselves. 
Upon closer inspection, it turns out that the main processor is actually on the bottom of this board, right here, and it has a firewire symbol for some reason. And here is the bottom input-output board. This contains a memory backup battery. That explains why this recorder was still keeping a somewhat accurate time. These are all double-layer boards with lots of surface mount components. Not good for unsoldering stuff. I have disassembled everything down to the DVD drive itself, and you can probably already tell this is really just a standard five and a quarter inch computer DVD drive. The only thing that's missing on the front is the eject button. As we go around to the side, there are all the standard mounting holes. The differences are on the back. There are some different connectors, as you can clearly see. However, all of the provisions for the standard connectors are there. So we do have this mini connector for power, but there is also a space for the standard Molex connector. Likewise, there is a space for a standard IDE connector, but that has been replaced with this mini connector that goes to a ribbon cable. Here are the connections for the IDE jumpers, master and slave. And over here, this jack was not used in the DVD recorder. And I think this is the analog audio output for really old computers. And finally, here is everything I salvaged from the Pioneer recorder. Not as much as I was able to salvage from the Samsung. As I've already said, it is difficult to unsolder stuff from double-layer circuit boards. Yes, it can be done, but I'm not spending 10 minutes to unsolder one single component. This once again confirms my experience that there is always more to salvage in cheap stuff. In detail, we have, of course, the Western Digital hard disk drive. This one is only 80 gigabytes, but it should still be useful for something after reformatting it. There is the adapter from IDE to a ribbon cable. That might be useful just for the IDE connector. And there is the Molex power connector, cable, and a filter choke. There is a 12 volt cooling fan with air guide. Once again, I'm keeping the entire power supply. And there is a random cable. Over here, we have a bunch of screws, various connectors, the button cell holder, and the button cell, as that still measures fine, the color filter of the display, and I'm keeping the whole entire back panel because when mounting RCA jacks into a case, it can be difficult to accurately cut the holes. So I find it easier to simply cut out a section of an existing back panel and put that section into the new case. And that's it. Thank you for watching.